Good morning to everyone. We are team number three and we're going to present our final project of numerical analysis that it's titled Chronic Penny Model for Energy Band Gaps. In solid state physics, the chronic penny model describes the energy of an electron inside a crystal. It was developed by these two scientists called Kronik, well, Ralph Kronik, and William Penny. This model supposes that the crystal structure is a periodical potential that changes abruptly. And even though this model is hypothetical, it helps a lot in calculations. Now, I will briefly introduce you these two scientists. We have Kronik, that was noted mostly because of the discovery of, the, of a particle spin, that it's an intrinsic form of angular momentum carried by different particles. For the theory of X-ray absorption spectroscopy, that it's a used technique for determining the electronic structure of matter. And finally, it has theories of cluster chronic transition. On the other hand, we have William Penny, that had a leading role in Manhattan Project in the development in Britain's nuclear program that produced the first British atomic bomb in 1952. His scientific contributions awarded him with the Wilhelm Exer Medal and the Rumford Medal for an important discovery in this field, which included mathematics for complex wave dynamics. Now, we are going to talk about our theoretical background, what's behind our model. Well, this model is also known as the particle in one dimensional lattice. In crystallography, the structure of the crystal is a description of the arrangement of atoms, ions, or molecules in a material. The crystal structures are a big part in solid state physics because it determines the cleverage, electronic band structure, and optical transparency as physical properties. The problem of one-dimensional lattice is a generalization of the free electron model that you can see in these two figures. The thing that differentiates the free electron model and the chronic penny model is that the free electron model as assumes that there is no potential inside the lattice. As you can see, you, there is no potential, they are only like curves but never touch the axis and they create electromagnetic field that electrons are subject to irregular potential on the lattice. In the other hand, quantum free electron theory of metals can actually explain electrical conductivity, specific heat, and among other concepts. The problem is that it fails to explain other physical properties like positive hole coefficients of metals, the difference between what a conductor and a semiconductor is, and so on. So, Kronik and Penny proposed this model and proposed periodic potentials because of the positive ions in the metals are considered. Finally, this problem is almost impossible to solve using Schrodinger's equation with the free electron model. So Kronik and Penny approximate these potentials as a rectangular continuous shape as shown in the next figure. One thing to note and a very important thing in order to understand our equations a bit later on is that the potential on the y-axis is going to be taken from zero on parts that we're going to name the domain of x from minus b to zero and the on the y-axis as on the potential that we're going to call u sub zero which on the domain of x is represented as an x between zero and a this is important because we are going to start with the Schrodinger time independent equation. And we're going to have to divide this into our two cases of interest, which are, as just mentioned, u equals zero, potential equals zero, and potential equals u sub zero. These two equations are clearly differential equations still, and with yet easier solutions, such as those in equation four and five. Each one, each one of those comes with its own implications. For example, in equation four, it comes with the implication that the energy epsilon is gonna have to be h bar squared times alpha squared divided by 2m. And for equation five, since we're gonna have to take into account u sub zero, which is no longer zero, it's a slight different variation of this. Now, in the later equations, we're going to have to search for the value of alpha, but 
it is important to know it is important to know that for any value of alpha uh, the value of epsilon the value of the energy epsilon will come just multiplying alpha by a few constants now we have our two solutions equations four and five but we're gonna have to modulate a bit a bit of them with the block theorem which essentially says that the eigenfunctions of the wave equation the schrodinger equation have the form uh this form phi of r equals u of r times e to the i k r where u of r has a periodicity of such ex explained where l is the transition vector of the lattices this applies to to in, in this context of of lattices and and potential wells so equations four and five have to be modulated with a relation such as that uh, portrayed on the right and this yields a system of four equations with four different constants a b c and d and we are free to choose uh, any one of these constants as long as they uh, as our solution phi and the derivative of phi satisfy the the usual quantum mechanical boundary conditions at least in problems that involve square potential wells such as x equals zero for the first two equations and x equals a for the last two equations now this system can be arranged into a matrix that has a zero determinant so we know that it's uh, solvable and after a rather tedious procedure we find that the solution is that explained in equation three although we can do one more thing by using a delta function with limits b equals zero and u sub zero at infinity we are left with the fact that q squared b a over two equals p which is a, a finite quantity and just uh, the limits and, and this limit q has to be much greater than alpha and qb is going to have to be much smaller than one this yields our final solution equation seven which we're going to have to call our main equation since it's what we're going to have to work with and the a here is the lattice constant we we were going to choose the lattice constant of of diamond 2.56 Armstrong Armstrong's but we decided to just use a equals one in terms of simplicity not only because of the of the one but because we usually use international units so in order to use something in the scales of Armstrong's and have that in terms of meters we were gonna have to deal with a bunch of scientific notation and 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 10 to the minus 10 digits and 10 to the minus 10 quantities of, of such magnitude that was going to make the problem uh, really harder. And P is just taken to be 3, 3 pi over 2 and we're going to have to variate the values of K and find the values of alpha for each K. Now since we're interested in efficiency, we're going to have to use a numerical method and we chose the search method, which is just basically a parameter variation, continually registered until a final result is achieved. And this process is repeated until the solution has been found or the maximum number of allowed iterations has been reached. For our case, th this is a general diagram, but for our case, we chose an interval on the x-axis since we're interested in root finding, that is where the graph crosses the x-axis we had a lot of intervals on the x-axis and the two and, and the initial and the final points these two points that make the interval are going to be multiplied and when the result of this multiplication is a negative number this is going to mean that at only one of these numbers is negative and the other is positive this means that between those it's a root there's a root so the interval just gets smaller and smaller until a solution is found and this is the code we made for that okay for the code we first defined our constants which were pi and p which i said before what is three times p over two then we defined our functions which we only defined our main fu main function we then defined the pro the program to ask the to ask him to use the constant and the function then define our variables which the importance were the lattice constant a 
the value of n e and n k which are the values that we are going to use for energies and for k's that uh, in in this uh, program the, then we define our j and our i which are the values which are the parts of the program that are going to be changing our values of k and e we then ask the program to do the search method and at the end we ask him to print the root values for alpha and and k we then made uh, this graph is obtained from our program and we made a graph from for alpha with respect to k in this case we can see that it is like if there were four functions this is because the part of the bottom looks like one function and the part of up looks, looks like another function this is because we use four functions uh, four values of e in this case we can see that there there are the band gaps there are between each one of the so-called functions or uh, values for each energy and the, these band gaps are between 3.1 and 4.9 and the others one are a little bit harder to see but if we see the graphic made on the next here we can see a better representation of the values before we managed to arrange them in a way that we can see the four energies and we can see that for the first energy the values obtained are between zero and pi the values for energy two are between pi and two pi and so on and so on but the band gaps here are more visually because here we can see that between the first energy and the second energy there is the band gap and we can see that they are dependent of n pi each of the energy then we wanted to see how this function work if we change our values of a in this case we used a value of a of 2 pi and we also made a graph of alpha with respect of k but here we can see that it is drastically drastically smaller and the the one before went on the y value up to 12 and here is 2 and we can see that the band gaps are also smaller because here are here they are from 0.5 to 1 this is because our main function is dependent of the sine and the cosine functions and while using 2 pi this graphic made a huge change we can conclude that working with different values of a was essential to comprehend the model because it is not as easy to visualize this function because there are a lot of values and we saw that if we change the value to further from 2 and pi and eh, they are more curved then we also can conclude that the band gaps depend on the values used because when we use one the band gaps were about two about two difference pi the values were much smaller we can also conclude that the program that we use is very simple but very powerful due to the fact that it could solve the chronic penny model and that's all for our presentation thank you very much for your attention we'll leave you our references and we hope you have a beautiful day bye bye <laughs>